Bon après-midi. Bon. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello, I'm Jean Lebel. I'm president of uh, the IDRC, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here today. I'm the president of the International Development Research Center, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you today here at this event. Nous avons avec nous uh, today with us with us will be one of the best scientists in Canada, Dr. Gary Cominger. Do I have to speak into this mic or this one? Okay, so I don't need this one? Okay, we'll turn it away then. Thank you. All right. On a Gary Kubinger. So we have Gary Kubinger with us today. Now he's head, uh, he's head of a team at the National Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, and he is working on revolutionary work that uh, has developed uh, over the past few years new vaccines uh, to deal with dangerous viruses. And his accomplishments uh, have uh, included the vaccine, vaccine against the Ebola virus. Uh, and this uh, uh, led to Gary and his team winning several awards. Uh, and I think uh, one of these distinctions is very rare in Canada. He's a Canadian media star. It's very rare for scientists. Now, this is a, an ironic situation because really Gary is perhaps uh, the one, one of the most humble people that I have the pleasure of knowing. And I think uh, that in Canada, in our country, we need, pe we need people like Wayne Gretzky that always know where the puck's going before it gets there. We also need uh, people like Gary also who can see where the next uh, public health problem and infectious disease uh, issue will arise and how it will be dealt with. Now, these people, these people are, in my opinion, not very often celebrated. And today, it's an honor for me to to have Gary here in Ottawa for his, and have him uh, talk about his work and what he's doing. Picture should be a household name across this country. The Ebola vaccine that he developed with his team, as well with support from the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, the Canadian Institute of Health Research, the Global Affairs Canada, and IDRC, should make us all proud. proud. Because of this collaboration last year, the trial process for testing and using the vaccine in real crisis situation was greatly accelerated. It's only in July of 2014 that Alain Baudet, president of CIHR, came to me and said, Jean, would you like to partner with me, with CIHR, in order to help out with testing this vaccine? Um, at that time, the Public Health Agency of Canada, where Gary is located, had available 5,000 doses that they were willing to use. And with the support of Global Affairs Canada, we mobilized the money in order to have the vaccine tested. He will tell about this story. And from the moment in March that we got the green light from everywhere in 2015, and July 2015, when the Lancet published a paper indicating that the vaccine was 100% effective, it was only four months that made a crucial change. At that time, 28,000 people had already died from the Ebola fever in West Africa. And if it would not have been of an international effort where Gary played a lead role, but he was not the only one, and he is very humble about this, uh, we would not have succeeded, and who knows where we would be today. The WHO Director General, Margaret Chan, called the vaccine a game changer. But the development of an Ebola vaccine is only one part of the solution. There's still a lot of work to do. Uh, what is the long-term effect of that vaccine? How in different population the vaccine is effective? These are simple questions that we still don't have and for which there's a research need. And also a vaccine is only one tool in the toolkit of any public health agency. You need also to have you know, the contribution of the population, their knowledge, their skills, and their resources sometimes that are extraordinarily effective to detect outbreaks. Gary at lunch was mentioning a story about you know, people in Asia, not in Asia, but in Congo, mentioning that pigs were dying before human. 
and that became, you know, very effective to test, you know, some of the vaccine because this animal was more sensitive. We cannot do this on a one-way street, and I think Gary over the years have demonstrated through his work in Congo in particular, that long-term investment and collaboration with African researcher in Congo leads to effective impact and result. Very few of you probably know that during the crisis of Ebola in Congo, there was an emergent that we had didn't heard of much. After 60 some fatalities, the lid was put back on the cover and the, mal the disease spreading stopped. Why? Because the Congolese knew what to do. Why did they knew what to do? Because for seven years, Gary has been going back and forward, long-term investment in research capacity, in teaching researchers how to do it, in bringing equipment. And once the crisis appeared, it was stopped. The situation was very different in Sierra Leone, Liberia, as well as in Guinea. Gary is the chief of the special pathogen biosafety level four program at the National Microbiology Laboratory in Winnipeg. He is the co-director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Diseases, Detection, Diagnostics, Reference and Research. He is co-chair of the Emerging and Dangerous Pathogens Laboratory Global Network for Outbreak Response and Readiness. You may also have seen this work on key feature of the National Geographic a program or on 60 Minutes and the BBC and in other national and international meaning, media, including CBC, CTV, Radio Canada, Découverte, and Tele Québec. He was named the Scientist of the Year 2015 by Radio Canada, an honor that very few get because it's only once per year. And we are here today to look forward to what Gary has done, what he is planning to do, as also he will be moving from Winnipeg to Quebec City this summer to head the Center for Research in Infectious Disease at Université Laval. And we wish you the best for this, Gary, and we will see each other for sure. And for me, it's a special honor to have Gary over here because we didn't know each other a year ago. We knew of each other, but we never met. And I met Gary as I invited it to the IDRC table at the Gerner Prize Award. Gerner Award are the highest prize, highest award in the world for public health. And we were welcoming Dr. Peter Piat from Belgium, who was the discoverer, the co-discoverer of the Ebola virus. And his, his speech, he made reference to two Canadians that he wanted to mentioned that has helped with the Ebola vaccine development and the fight in West Africa. First, Joanne Liu from Médecins Sans Frontières, the uh, executive director, international director that is from Montreal. And at the table of IDRC, we had Médecins Sans Frontières Canada, you know, so. And the second was Dr. Gary Kobinger. And Gary was also at my table, which made Alain Baudet, the president of CIHR, that has his own table, come to me afterwards saying, what have you done? And I said, I only work with the best. <laughs> <laughs> and Alain still laugh about it. Um, I want to tell you another anecdote before I leave it to Gary. We have in the audience here today, our youngest participant in all those events that IDRC has been organizing. And I want, je veux mentionner la présence d'Alexandre. I'd like to mention the presence uh, of Alexandre. He's seven years old. He's the son of one of our employees here at the IRDC. He has a scientific uh, uh, magazine, Le Petit de Brouillard. Now, he, he calls uh, Gary uh, the virus hunter of Africa. Virus hunter. And he told his mom, He's coming to Ottawa. I want to see him. So today, Alexandre took a day off to meet with Gary, and this morning he even got an autograph. You know, so you know, 
and you can show it in your magazine there, Alexandre. So, Alexandre, c'est un grand honneur de nous. So it's a great honor to have you with us here today, and I think uh, that if uh, Gary. Uh, uh, signing autographs now. He's no longer the Wayne Gretzky of uh, research. He's now the Bono of research because he's he's working in where the streets have no names because he believes in One Elf, which is also a U, a U2 song, but he's also a guy who will convince you that it's worth investing in research because it changes the lives of people here and elsewhere. So I'd ask you to welcome Dory Kobinger. And question period afterwards. Merci beaucoup. Thank you so much. I uh, made me nervous on this great introduction. <laughs> I'm usually very calm, but I'm hearing this. I'm like, wow, I hope they won't think I'm the next big thing, best thing after sliced bread because uh, <laughs> sliced bread is hard to eat. Um, Alexandre, merci beaucoup. Alexandre, thanks very much for being with us this morning. That's really the greatest vote of thanks I've ever had, I think. It's great to have you here with us. Thanks very much for being here. I'm very happy to have you here to listen to my presentation today. Thanks very much. Alexandre made a brownie biscuit, a brownie cookie. And as he said, uh, it's, science is just like cooking, isn't it? You're right. You're completely right. I'm going to present, um, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a different uh, presentation. And before I do this, I wanted to thank uh, Jean very, very much for inviting me. I'm, I'm very privileged, actually, to be here. Uh, every time I come to Ottawa, I meet like fantastic people, and it's amazing how uh, how we are so many actually working uh, towards the same goals. And before also I start this presentation, I want to mention that the, often the, the vaccine uh, and treatment are attributed to me, but you know, really, really big uh, disclosure here. It's a huge team, uh, not only in Winnipeg first. Uh, but also scientists that were there before that have moved to other places uh, in the, in Europe, in the U.S., and mainly, mainly who did all the work is uh, in Africa and in, in Guinea that did uh, the work on the ground uh, themselves. So, uh, so that's very important to acknowledge. Um, get, to get back to this presentation, I'm going to try to go over um, a few things over 30 minutes so that we have time to, to discuss. Uh, and if you have questions... And why it's a bit different is I want to, the first part of the talk is I want to tr try to show you, um, I think there's an agreement that the Ebola vaccine, although uh, not uh, fully conclusive now, it's still a project, an ongoing project. But it is, um, the reality is, is it is the only vaccine, not because it's the only vaccine that works, but it's the only vaccine that was uh, developed and moved in uh, in uh, lucky f with a lot of support from great people and it, it things everything fell in place and it's a vaccine that we can all at, at least agree that is a success to have made it that far and that I want to use it as a, let's look at this what did go right and and how can we use this recipe maybe or the same processes and the same uh, kind of approach to um, to tackle another um, um, dreams of many of us, which is to uh, build capacity uh, in Central and Western Africa and Eastern Africa, to tell the truth, and Asia, and it never ends, but um, we'll start with, uh, uh, with Africa. And I, I want to show you how not only uh, we can, um, and this is what the, the title says, not only we can uh, achieve greatness, uh, but we can learn ourselves. So greatness is on both sides. We can learn ourselves a lot from those uh, those things. Not only it's not a one-way uh, exchange, and and only one size will benefit. It's very important for us to be to be part of this. And this is my message. I'm going to try to convey today, is to convince you how uh, how important this is. So, very briefly, for people who don't know how uh, um, uh, important infectious diseases are, um, I I always like to point out. Uh, that is actually double all cancer together in terms of weight on our uh, uh, our human society. Um, this is quite substantial. And to give you numbers in Canada, um, cancer, 
roughly um, receive about 500 million of funding a year. Infectious disease, about 150 million a year. Uh, and it's not to say that we should re decrease cancer, by no means. Uh, but we have to recognize that infectious disease that in, in the mind of many people is, is, a, is a problem of yesterday because of antibiotics. Antibiotics don't work against viruses. Viruses don't, uh, don't stop at borders. Uh, they do transmit. And the reality is in the past 30 years, including also because of resistance to, to bacteria, um, the, the number of, uh, the, the problem of infectious disease has grown. Um, and, and I think it's safe to say it won't stop uh, unless we, we stop it. It won't stop on its own. Um, this this uh, slide that I took from uh, a colleague at NIH, uh, it, it's again to, to, to see the same point. So you, you see every dot is a different infectious disease. You have all the names. They're, the names are not that important. And um, I, I can guarantee you that that map is actually inaccurate because Canada has no infectious disease according to it. And it's definitely not true. And, and we are part of the global community. And when we go somewhere also to respond is not only to to help others, but it's also to help the international community, which we're part of, um, and, and to stop those diseases um, before they spread. So Ebola was actually a, um, a very important um, uh, lesson for many, including for me. Uh, you know, the, the and, and this slide is, is dated August 11. I still like it because it was actually in the heat of the moment uh, when the outbreak was actually quite alarming and, and when MSF had already said it was out of control but it was still now we know at the beginning uh, and I think there is great lessons to um, to learn from from Ebola um, including that there was another outbreak and I'm going to sh show you something there was another outbreak in 2014 at the same time that that uh, the outbreak was raging in West Africa in DRC in the, the, the Democratic Republic of the Congo and I'm going to show you that within three months they shut it down and they did it themselves. And this because for seven years before, there was a collaboration between them and others uh, where build, building capacity uh, made a difference in, uh, finally in 2014. So, so back to the vaccine and how, what can we learn from it? This slide is showing you that um, there is two vaccines that made it to phase three clinical trials. So that's the largest phase you can, you can get to. And it's the VSV that was developed in Winnipeg. And interestingly, the CHIMP adenovirus-based vaccine uh, that um, was not developed in Winnipeg per se, but the foundation of it, the first um, uh, simian adenovirus vaccine were developed in, Vinica, in Winnipeg. The, the first publication in 2006 was, was out of Winnipeg. Um, and, and I think, again, that's, uh, that's a, a great um, example of um, one place. We're only one place but uh, a place that, uh, that made a, a good contribution, uh, but not alone. The, this this uh, section shows you that the approach that was used to show uh, and to link, to associate the vaccine with effect effectiveness was ring vaccination. Uh, so which means that once somebody gets uh, positive as a positive diagnostic, um, the vaccine can be made available uh, and offered to a member of the family, the neighbors, the friends, people that are around. And this is not a new concept. This was used for smallpox. But it's a new, con it's, a, it's a comeback to it because it's not being used anymore. But for this case, it was used because also the number of cases were going down. Um, and it was important to come up with a, a, um, a concept that will address the question, is the vaccine working? And by re reusing uh, this, this ring vaccination approach, uh, the numbers are showing the reality of this publication, which is that um, there is an association, a real association. Everybody that got vaccinated, after 10 days, they were all protected. None of them in that group developed the disease uh, or, or were, were infected. So, so what can we learn from this? Um, let me show you this list. The, the names on, on the left are different vaccines, so each row is a vaccine, and it's not so important on many. Uh, but you see there's a lot of vaccine there. Uh, and these are all Ebola vaccine that all that were tested in the non-human primate model, a, a very difficult model in the sense of it's, it's, it's a lot of work to get there. You have to work for years and years before you get there. This is the last step before human. These are extremely demanding experiment in terms also of ethical review because they are 
difficult uh, 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 study to justify, and the only justifiable if it's the step before human. But look at the number of vaccines that have been uh, working. So only two out of those uh, made it to phase three. Um, and at this point, I love this slide I got from uh, Dr. Teja Tam within the agency. Uh, and, and it says, you know, at this point, what we had is vaccine, and we had vaccines to save animals, basically. Uh, but how do we make the step to um, to translate that to human? And it is still a big, a big, uh, uh, you know, open question. Uh, I don't mean to have the, the final answer and tell you this is why. Uh, I think there is a lot of puzzles of uh, pieces of that puzzle that fell in place the right way at the right time. Uh, but one thing that that was a big initial. Um, um, argument to, uh, to support the VSV vaccine is the compassionate use back in 2009 in the in lab workers in Germany that pricked herself with a needle uh, working with Ebola. And so the assumption was that she had been infected, although there was no proof. But the no knowledge at the time was that every one of those nail pricks led to an infection. And every one of those with Ebola Zaire led to a, a person dying. So there was, uh, there was a case fatality rate of 100%, although the number of cases were thankfully very small. Uh, but so that, per, that person, the, the vaccine left Winnipeg and in 36 hours was in Germany, was offered to that, uh, that person who decided to go ahead and, and receive it. And, and the big um, thing that came out is, is, you know, it was never proven that she was infected or not, uh, but the vaccine was safe, relatively speaking, in this N of one doesn't mean that much, but people became comfortable and they knew that this was a very uh, efficient vaccine. So compassionate use was, was I think, very important and it's something that I think we, we need to consider uh, with experimental uh, strategy. And, and another thing that, that um, really triggered this race uh, of, uh, and I'm, I don't mean the race for winning, but uh, this, this very quick movement of uh, experimental uh, vaccine and drugs is the again, compassionate use of the, experiment, the experimental uh, treatment called Zima that was developed in, Vin in Winnipeg uh, into the, the two Americans, uh, uh, Ken Brantley and Nancy uh, Weibel uh, in, in Liberia. And, and this prompted, within two weeks, a discussion at WHO. They were very fast. And the, the discussion was, is it ethical to consider uh, experimental treatment and vaccine following a risk assessment. And the, the, the answer after one day of discussion was yes, a big yes. And this was a big green flag and everybody moved forward with, the, with their vaccine, experimental vaccine and, and accelerated everything. Another aspect is, um, I think that is important is the, the Public Health Agency of Canada that decided to, to give um, 5,000 vials initially and added more after that uh, to, uh, to WHO. And WHO received those vials and uh, Mary Paul Kearney told me after that, well, I didn't know what to do with them. Like we did not have even a freezer. And, 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 and this, you know, was of, co of course resolved very quickly and prompted a massive movement from WHO, a role they had never played before. Uh, so this was a great idea to do this, to send the doses and to, to stimulate the movement. This slide is, is, uh, is to tell you how many Canadian partners got together to get this vaccine. Um, moving in, in, in uh, West Africa and, and also here. There was a phase one here with Scott Alperin uh, in Canada. There was different phase one in the U.S., in Europe, before it moved to, uh, to Central Africa um, in, uh, in Guinea. And so all these partners with IDRC being uh, one of the leader uh, um, has, um, has been a cornerstone of, uh, of, uh, of that movement. But there was more. The Minister of Health of Guinea, of course, was um, a, big, a big part of this. The, the trials did happen on their, in their country with their people running it. Uh, the Norwegian Institute of Public Health was also uh, playing an important role, coordinating funding. Uh, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, played a, a very big role on the ground, um, helping with the, the, they are the best at, uh, uh, at those uh, kind of logistical uh, challenges. And the WHO, of course, again, that, that played a new role that had never been uh, uh, played before. Um, before that, before that, DRC shared their viruses. Guinea shared their viruses. This is why we were able to develop vaccine starting in 2001. 
without having those viruses, we were not able to do anything. So this is a very important uh, contribution and, and recognition that we should, uh, they should have. And, and because it's very important without, again, the, that first step of sharing openly uh, those, those viruses, all this work has, would not have been possible. So, so this worked out fantastically well. Um, you know, in, in one year and a half, uh, it, the work that, uh, that normally would have taken 10 years uh, was done. Um, it, I'm a very demanding person for, some, for myself, but unfortunately, if you would ask my people in my lab, I think they really like me, but they, I'm, I'm also sometimes a bit uh, <laughs> demanding. And, uh, and, um, I have the same problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the year and a half, I think, could be shorter now, uh, especially now that we can look back at it, at what went well, and focus on those steps and processes, and the discussion like from the ethical side can have can happen before uh, with different scenarios. Um, and, and we can have processes that may move experimental vaccine and drug faster and still yet safely. If you face a, a public health event where you have a 0.001% of case fatality rate with uh, an infection rate of an attack rate of 10%, you're talking about very few people. Um, but if you have a 3% only and you have an attack rate of 80%, you're talking about maybe something close to uh, Spanish flu. Uh, and, and that killed uh, about 500 millions of people at the time when the world population was, low, was uh, smaller. So the, the bottom line is, is not only African public health affect us all, the world public health affect us all. And this is what we can recognize. And this slide I, I also like is, uh, was, was a bit early in the outbreak. Uh, and, and you know little that um, or Bruce knew at the time that these numbers were basically multiplied by tenfold, and that you know it went to 20, over 28,000 confirmed cases and over 11,000 uh, confirmed dead um, due to Ebola. So, very simple slide. So, no, no, no one country can do it alone, and uh, so simple solution. Let's get together and solve this. And and this is what I want to show you now is uh, how. Can we help and how can we contribute and how can we uh, contribute for ourselves and, and, and uh, benefit and make others benefit from collaborations? And this is um, how an outbreak should be um, tackled. And you can see that it's actually very complex. And I don't mean to come up now with a solution that will solve this all in two months. Um, I want to give you an example of what I think worked for the RC. Uh, and, and I think can be expanded to, to others now. Um, so this, this program that we want to we wanna start, and now I think we, we really have uh, not only recognized the opportunity, but uh, I, I will repeat this, this is happening now. And, and our decision is, uh, do we, we want to be part of this? And if yes, uh, to, to what extent? Um, you will understand that I'm convinced that, of course, we should be part of this because we have a lot to gain. Um, uh, and the, the international community has a lot to gain on this. Uh, and the, the program is a training program for rapid data-driven responses to infectious public health event in Africa, and that's the title of it. Um, and what it does, basically, is to use the example of DRC, which I'm going to show you, um, and, and basically um, expand it to other countries um, and foster partnership, um, including teaching, mentoring between African countries, but also with us, um, and to use research as a basis to support this. Because the big challenge in there is that you can do something and, and have funding for five years, and if you're lucky for 10 years, or you can renew it after five years, if you already have the five years. Um, but, but how long is it going to last? Well, DRC, we're now we're, we're um, um, 16 years, and it's still going. Um, I think it's, it's great uh, that we have, done, we have achieved that. Um, I'm sorry, I should take that back. I'm, it's not 16, I don't know why I'm, uh, it's nine years. Uh, but it's still going. And, and I think nine years is, uh, is, uh, is a phen phen phenomenal contribution. Um, and, and the reason why, why we believe this is, uh, um, this is gonna be a, a, of tremendous value is that, and why Africa, uh, you know, could, could be Southeast Asia where there's a lot of pathogen also, but Africa has a lot of pathogen and dangerous pathogen that have the potential to spread and cause major 
disruption not only in uh, in the social um, uh, cohesion of any uh, uh, nation but also any continent and I'm, I'm talking about look at the cost of, of West Africa the economic impact that this has had is tremendous on, on also on travel on the trade uh, it is it is something that you know has happened in West Africa and could happen again uh, anywhere um, and the next maybe uh, and I don't mean to scare anybody you know it's, it's not about scare it's about solutions and about being ready for these things um, and and the reason also I think to um, so I like why Africa is um, is there is there is already a very good structure there. There is level three. There is level four in Africa. South Africa has a level four. Gabon has the the, the capacity to handle level four pathogen, um, and and it's growing. So the proposed vision is what we think will remedy a number of public health related challenges, and it's not only from the the bio. Uh, the, the public health response is also the biosafety. It's also the biosecurity. I was very happy to see Trevor Smith finally in this room after many, many uh, hours I would say on the phone with him. Uh, that is more uh, focused on biosecurity uh, and for good reasons. Uh, so, so I think we have a great opportunity here to, um, to, to combine this. And you know, I'm not the only one saying this. I mean, let's face it, the EU has a huge project moving on. The US has a, a, a huge, huge project uh, moving on, and we are more focused, and we are more, and we we are with all of those people, uh, and we are maybe the little surgeon that is trying to get something done very specifically. So this this slide that actually date from 2012, and every pro dot that has a number is actually the project we wanted to do back in 2012, um, and the the empty blue is what happen is is where West Africa is, and where basically uh, locations that could benefit greatly from um, uh, capacity building. But the, but the red dots are places that are very strong. That, and and this, this is the goal of this project, is to foster um, countries that are stronger for some aspect with countries that need to build more capacity. And again, we benefit a lot from this because uh, we learn tremendously, you would see how the, the DR Congo respond to outbreak on the ground with their epidemiologists, especially their communication officers that are going out, communicate to the population, bring the, the, the level of anxiety down and make sure that the, the public message gets out. It's one of the most efficient um, tool to, uh, to control an outbreak. So the project is in two phases. And, and again, these things are moving. So. Um, uh, you know, we we want to we want on the train, and the first phase in an assessment uh, phase, where it's not about what we think they should do; it's about what they think they should do and what they need to do. And the leadership needs to come from them, not from us. We're we're there to to support. We're there to um, be part of it and and to help the best we can. But the the this whole project is now standing on scientific project, okay, research project. And it's not the question we want to address. It's a question that they want to address that I think we need to support. And so the question they need to address will be of interest to us. I guarantee you that. I know it. I'll give you some example of this. And, and this is the phase two, is to get that research going because research is something that never stops once you start it. Countries always are interested in research. The project change, of course. And but, but that doesn't matter. What, what matters is you build a capacity, and then you have a research capacity, and then these, this research will bring knowledge, will bring fun, uh, money to get those uh, skills up, diagnostic, detection, uh, and so on and so forth. Working in a biosafety uh, environment that is secure, uh, and secure not only for people working in it, but secure for the world as well, uh, where agents are staying there and not uh, leaving uh, on their own. And this again this program is is to be uh, coordinated with the african union african nations many of them I, I i showed you just a few on this list uh there is ongoing uh, big project from the us from uh, the eu with horizon 2020 including and the pastor institutes um, it's linked to edpnl it's it's over 200 institution right now uh, that are engaged in uh, in getting this uh, going and i mean if you if you look if i if, you know i received the the the, the U.S. Uh, 
proposal. It's a, it's a brick, and it's basically everything under the sun. Uh, but it's a different approach. We have a different approach. And linking to them is going to be great for them as well as for us. And it's going to be great for Africa as well. And this is the blueprint we want to use after that for other regions. So the key outcome of this is um, a precise roadmap with the initiation and execution of a training program linked to a robust research platform. And again, the, the platform is to drive a sustainable first line of defense with enhanced surveillance diagnostic tools and so on and so forth and manage bio risk and others. Um, now I'm going to show you just a few examples of what this research could be. But keep in mind, this is not us to come and say this is what we're doing. It's to develop those research programs. I just wanted to give you an example. This is, this is rest and Ebola virus that affects when, when people say, what is the concept of One Health? If you look at this slide, this is what it is. It's the animal side, it's the environment, uh, it's uh, the, 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 the human side, the food chain, the making of solution, vaccine, treatment, everything is on this slide. Something like this, a project like this, a research project like this, will bring, because it has to, bring the ability, building capacity to detect not only a virus of interest, and I put it rest on, why not Rift Valley fever? That is also a big problem. Um, but something that is of interest to them, and any one of those dots there could be addressed in a global uh, um, um, perspective uh, where many things can be done. Another one is, uh, I like this one, I, I'm not even sure I understand very well. What's, this is from a colleague of mine. But let me just tell you what he told me but, so I understand the concept. So the, what this means here, what this means here, is, the, is, is what he's doing is super cool. So he's giving, you, you need a, a smartphone, puts an app on it, gives that to the physician, okay, at the location. Let's call it location X. So the physician, they, they uh, make diagnostic based on X, Y, Z, they enter it on the phone. So uh, let's say it is, um, um, it really doesn't matter, like, uh, let's say it's anthrax. Um, um, Charbon, I managed the Charbon. Uh, Antrax, um, suspected or confirmed, um, lab confirmed, enter in the phone, and then uh, these line of antibiotics are um, um, uh, being uh, um, uh, prescribed and administered, and the outcome is this. This goes in the app. It's a very simple thing. You just answer it, a few click, and then it, it takes the data, okay, of hundreds of physicians that are working in a specific area, and it sends it to a server. The server will do the analysis, will chew it up, and will come back and over, let's say this is over a month, will predict the emergence of resistance. And instead of waiting for it, will give options to physician. Now you may consider this family of antibiotics if you have access to them. And what they have shown in that study is that if, if you do three cycles of different antibiotics, you get back to the initial start with the same sensitivity as the first antibiotic, and you have not developed any resistance along the way. So this is another project that needs uh, that needs people on the ground that needs to uh, to be uh, to be double checked. So uh, you know that's a, a pretty cool uh, project right there. And you know he, he gave me the slides like field study that gives computer the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. Um, but it needs to be trained. I like this because, I mean, it's the essence of, it, of this entire project. It's, it needs training. We all need training. Um, another one is um, showing this vaccine platform. Um, and this is actually the vaccine platform that's one of many we consider for Zika. And this is the one that we have picked, uh, decided to, uh, to go uh, forward with. Uh, with Zika, it's a plasmid DNA. It was tested here in Canada in phase one clinical study. Uh, in uh, Winnipeg, we did the phase one for an influenza universal uh, concept of a vaccine uh, that was actually quite good. Uh, and it's, it's not published yet, but I can tell you it's twice as efficient in the 65 uh, and older population as the conventional vaccine. Uh, so I think it's something promising. There is a, a phase one clinical trials, uh, MERS ongoing right now with this pla vaccine platform. We're doing the an analysis in Quebec. Um, the, the Zika is scheduled for the summer, pending approval from uh, the regulator. So Al Canada will receive our application next week. Uh, the application to the FDA went last week uh, or this week. Um, 
the, the vaccine has been used for HPV. It is the only vaccine right now that is has uh, the, not only a preventive but curative uh, capacity or, or um, data to support that when it's given to women that do are, do, are positive for HPV and have lesions, the, the, the lesions reverse and disappear uh, in some cases. So it's a platform that we decided to go ahead because we don't know the correlates of protection against Zika. We don't know if it's antibody or T cells. And this vaccine do, does both. It's a very safe vaccine, doesn't replicate. It's, you inject and it's over, it disappears. It doesn't stay in your system. Uh, after about a month, it's gone, uh, but it does the job. And, and this kind of vaccine is something we wanna bring to also to Africa because this is a very low cost technology, very stable. You can leave it uh, uh, in four degrees for years and it still be uh, uh, efficient. So there's a very good profile uh, with this vaccine. Another study that this is my little uh, close to my heart, I must say, but this one actually came from DRC uh, following discussion with, uh, with uh, the director general of the, the lab there and, and the, the um, uh, secretary of health is that they noticed that a lot of Ebola outbreak actually happened next to park. This is not common knowledge, it's never been published because it's, uh, it's, it's like the pig story. It's, uh, it's more like an anecdotal. And so this pigs that is called poor, poor, poor animals called the, the Red River Hog is also called the Red Devil uh, in, in Africa, has been in those parks and has been always, there's an Ebola break, there's a park right next. And often it was demonstrated the hunters that are going in the park to hunt, they come back and they are the one that gets sick. So we don't know if they play any role, honestly, it's all, it's all there. But so what they want to do as one of their project is they want to go, they opened their park. DRC opened their park the first time in the history to do a, a, a bio study uh, on this kind of project uh, to, to go, we, they will let us go with them and, uh, and sample the, those wild animals. So it's just um, anesthesia. They trap them and anesthesia would take a blood sample, we let them go after that. And just to see, you know, what's, what's um, if they play any role in not only Ebola, but other infectious disease. So I'm almost done. I just want to show you another example of a project that was done in DRC. It's uh, environmental sampling. Uh, this is to be a bit the detective on the ground to try to, to find where the last cases in an outbreak are. And what we found in 2012 with them is that you can go to places and we do swabs and we find a virus, crazy places, like 10 days after the last person known uh, was present with Ebola confirmed cases. And this is how in 2012 we shut down this outbreak they shut down the outbreak. The last case at the bottom, Mado, it doesn't matter, but the last, the last box, red, um, was actually found because of this uh, envir environmental sampling. And because we found that last chain of transmission, we could shut it down, cut trains of trans transmission, and this was the end of the outbreak. So this is another very cool project. And let me show you now why we think it's gonna work. Is this, this was in the news. A tale of two outbreaks, why Congo conquered Ebola. Um, two outbreaks, two different outcomes. One in West Africa was at the time already in the thousands, and we know now tens of thousands. And in the DRC, 66 cases, 49 dead. When they showed up, there was already over a dozen cases, m most of which uh, died actually, because there was no support structure. And they were extremely fast. The Minister of Health was there first. They slept outside with the Secretary of, of, of Health that I know very well now. And this was a huge difference. Like it brought everybody together to go and, and fight this. And this is their lab that you can see. Uh, so the, the first top one is a, again doing environmental sampling. And what I wanna show you with this is I'm very lightly dressed because I'm not doing the, the one doing really the work. Jimmy, my friend, uh, uh, Jimmy is a physician in the DRC. Uh, is doing it all now, is running this entire place, and, and it's fantastic to, um, to be just, you know, a guest there and, and, uh, and help the best I can. And the lab that they had built is, uh, when I arrived, um, is, is part of um, some of the equipment, is 80% of the equipment is like equipment we assembled with them, we, we found left and right, uh, and, and that uh, Jimmy is responsible of now. And what I want to show you with this is that when you look at the WHO website, and I, I want to make the point that I'm not claiming that this is because of us. I want to tell you that it's not because of us. I want to tell you that it's because of many players. So WHO on their website, they write, plus strong technical assistance and support from WHO. This is why the outbreak was, was shut down. And I agree with them also that they helped a lot. Uh, MSF 
did a lot of uh, helped a lot too, and they, uh, in, they are very uh, um, very um, consistent with themselves. They never claim any any achievement or anything. Uh, another one is USCDC that also was there, and and it's interesting uh, because um, it do, the, it's this is on the CDC uh, website. It also didn't hurt that the CDC had been studying monkeypox in the same forest since. So we got every year since 2010 and train. And they're right. Actually, the machine that is in front of Jimmy, it's a smart cycler. And that machine is from uh, USCDC, it was, was brought there for monkeypox from 2010. The other one next to it is actually uh, uh, from FAC on a long-term uh, loan, um, of course. Um, the, and, and this is what, um, what made it work. But what I want to tell you with this is, is Together, what the agreement is, it's not, it's, it's not important. That's, I'm glad that everybody's claiming uh, you know, a contribution because it's true. Every, there is many players that contributed. It was not one doing, do it all. But what's important is that this is why it is worth building up health system everywhere. And, and this is the, the conclusion on, on this uh, CDC website. So final slide um, is that we helped a lot. A lot of other people helped a lot, US, UK, I mean, the entire EU, um, China, Asia, name it. But who did the real work on the ground? Who put their citizen um, to work there is people from Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia. And they won that, that battle. So I, I, again, I think that it's up to them also to, uh, uh, to show us how to manage these things better. And this is why I think, again, it's... Um, um, it's a great opportunity, and th this is just uh, some of the, um, you know, the goals that I just wanted to kind of repeat. But I want to just finish with this: How is this fitting with Quebec? And people are saying, "Are oh, you leaving Winnipeg?" And today I heard a great comment from uh, um, um, a colleague of mine from CFIA: "Is that actually you're not leaving Winnipeg? You're just moving to expand to another location." This is it. She's right. I have a project starting in Winnipeg. Uh, in a few months, a very exciting project with Hannah actually on the CFIA side, um, and it's just expanding. Uh, the reality is, uh, people sometimes ask me: is uh, first, of course, um, I've been away from Quebec for 22 years. I'm going back home. I was raised there. I, I have, I feel I have a debt to the university that trained me, um, and I want to help the young in, uh, investigators. But I want to show you this structure because this structure to me is what I'm building now with their help. And this, this is what they already had been building for years with Michel Bergeron. This to me is what Canada needs everywhere, at least one in per province. And I think the world needs as well. So it's called IRID for IRID of infectious disease. And IRID stands for Innovative Rapid Response Infectious Disease. And what it does, it's just four cores. The first core is discovery and detection of pathogen before they hit us. So this is great because this is linked to diagnostic, uh, at the same time, new diagnostic tools, including those metagenomic approaches that, that you, you incredible. 300,000, 320,000 pathogens have not been discovered yet. 320,000 pathogen, infectious pathogen. Well, okay, that's crazy. I'm, I'm going to retire. I'm, I'm telling you, like, before I get, we get there. And, and so that's the first core. The second core is a rapid vaccine development with lots of platforms that are already uh, at least some level uh, advance in the clinic and that we can pick from. We can say this vaccine, Zika is coming out. This to us is the best vaccine. Why we, we, we think this? Also because we have data from West Nile. So with data from existing platform or, or uh, problems, we can extend that. And the third core is clinical evaluation. Quebec is, is very strong on this. They have clinical uh, sites. Um, that of different size, so we can roll this into at least have safety data. It's, it's just the beginning of it. Trust me, it's not the vaccine being licensed. We have a, a phase one clinical trial scheduled for this summer. We hope, pending approval from Health Canada and the FDA. If it does happen, it doesn't give us a vaccine license at all, but it gives us a vaccine as an option that can be considered as an option. When Ebola started, we had a vaccine in the freezer. Imagine that. We had no safety data. So if we accumulate safety data, it's a really low cost. A, a clinical, clinical trials phase one, if you want to know, it can be done for $300,000. Now you're going to say, woof, $300,000. When you look at the billions of dollars that West Africa costs, it's not a big investment. Uh, and so the, finally, the, 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 the final core is infrastructure and, and a bio, uh, bio bank, basically, to store 
all the reagents that are developed for, for diagnostic, all the new vaccines, all the new treatment uh, that have safety data and that we can go and say, well, you know, maybe we should try that one. And that's it. Thank you so much for your, your attention. And I'll be happy to, um, to take any questions. Merci, uh, Gary. Uh, Thanks very much, Gary. Thank you. Down and have a sip of water before we go into the question period. And for you to have a little bit of a, a breath, uh, I'm going to tell the story. This morning I was with Gary, and, you know, when he was young, he wanted to be uh, an astrophysicist looking at the universe, the cosmos. And at some point, you know, his career changed to the virus, which is probably the smallest, you know, living organism. So, you know, he's a man of the extreme. And, you know, I think that your presentation, Gary, is, uh, you know, probably covering an extensive uh, amount of ground from, you know, the fact that emerging diseases are important and infectious diseases are still present in our world. It's a bit different in Canada than it is in Congo or in uh, West Africa or in other places, but they are a significant burden. Uh, the second thing I take home is that the work on the Ebola virus was not done through competition. It was done through collaboration. That's right. And that the investment that initiated this was far from being seen as a solution in the quick you know, a very quick turnover. It took us, or took you and your colleagues all over the world, 15 years to come. But the learning from this is now you're working on platform, and it's a concept people sometimes don't understand platform. It's like, you know, the carpenter having a drill, that's the platform. And you change the, the bit, the mesh, and by changing this bit and this mesh, you change the type of vaccine. So, you know, you can have the drill, it gives you the opportunity to make holes, different size. But with the drill in vaccine platform, you just change the mesh, and then you have Ebola, you change the mesh, you have it for Zika, you change the, the drill, you have it for, you know, influenza. So these platforms are quite powerful because now they are a revolution in virology, you know, in, the, in vaccination, uh, as we can use them to you know, immune people against multiple disease or make the development of these vaccines faster. The case of Zika is a good example. You were saying, you know, you have been working for two years on the Zika and we are starting testing phase one. Now, many people are not familiar with phase one, two, and three, and four. I just want to tell you phase one is to check if the vaccine is safe. Phase two is to check if you have an immune response, you know, if the vaccine is effective in generating a response of protection by the body. A phase three is testing it in the field to see in real condition if it's effective. And phase four is the deployment, you know, and the commercialization. In the late term, I'm not an expert. And for Zika, it's quite remarkable that we are already moving potentially this summer with a phase one trial to check the toxicity. Now, you ask why? Well, that's the basic first step that we need. And to think about having a solution in Latin America and Asia and also in Africa, Zika is present in Africa. And we know now that Zika is there to stay. Gary was telling me this morning that Zika is now found, found in other animals, you know, not only human. It seems in monkeys, it seems in other, you know, mammals, so therefore it will circulate. So it's important that we look at solution, you know, and vaccine is part of the toolkit that we need. And the last point I take from your uh, remarks, uh, Gary, is that if you are to engage in this type of journey with collaboration in the world, you know, and particularly in the developing world as it is the the, the ground and the area where IDRs intervene, you need to think over the long term. The investment needs to be not for one year, it needs to be for, you know, many, 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 many years. And only through that we see success. The case of Congo and, the, you know, stopping the spread of Ebola is quite telling. And I think people need to hear this because it's possible. 
We had the same situation in northern Uganda with Dominic Corti at Lachor Hospital in 2000, where there were 400 cases. And because the hospital knew what to do, 600 kilometers from the capital, they were able to stop the spread of this disease. So, you know, these are stories that we don't necessarily hear a lot in the media because we see the people dying dramatically. But there's a way to control those diseases. So let's move to the audience. And if you have any questions, si vous avez des questions, présentez-vous au microphone. So if you have any questions, please go to the mic, give your name, give your question, and uh, give your comment. The mics, uh, your, your name, identify yourself, and uh, your question or uh, comments. Please. My name is Bruce Couchman. I'm wondering if the military conflict and civil war in the Congo in any way interfered with the distribution of vaccines, or was it particularly where the cases arose that, I mean, were there areas where you could not distribute the vaccine? Um, so, so the vaccine was only distributed in Guinea, not in the Congo, though. Uh, you're right, there is, there is conflict on the east side. Every time that we have been, we've been once uh, in an outbreak where it was close to a conflict zone. And we actually were uh, only 100 kilometers from, uh, from a, a rebel uh, known uh, enclave. And, you know, we were a bit nervous about it. And the, the story with this is, is me, I thought that 100 kilometers was really not far enough, so to speak, that, you know, somebody could come and get us like within an, a few hours. And, uh, but but the the reality is that the communities are great and the uh, the the basically uh, pass the alarm on faster than uh, than anybody can move. It seems so. Uh, anyway, it has never been a problem to tell the truth. Uh, the the conflict, but the conflict have have a huge impact in the in the structure in the infrastructure that are available, and because they they destroy infrastructure that take years and years and years to rebuild. Uh, so that that's the. That's the, the really big negative impact that we have seen over and over and over, you know, where we were going. And, and because infrastructure even include roads, some places there was no road. Like we, we went, uh, at one point we went to, it was 600 kilometers, but it was four days on the road um, to cover that. And, and with only a stop for like six hours at night uh, to try to sleep in the car. So, uh, it's, so yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely not helping anybody. Yeah. And we see, you know, the representation of Zhou and Liu at the UN General Assembly earlier this week about stop bombing the hospital. Uh, often, the center where they are developing the research for these type of diseases are located in hospital. And I think that something that will be discussed further at the uh, WHO General Assembly in a few days. Other question, comments, observation, Damien. Hi, Damien Chadwick, a World Federation of Science Journalists. Um, I'm trying to understand the dynamics behind the platform, the response aspect of you're trying to build, how it, that links up with general public health in those countries. You know, we've seen in that Western Africa the effect of Ebola on general health. Uh, um, you know, we've got an outbreak right now uh, in Sierra Leone of, uh, of uh, small, smallpox. Uh, um, Monkeypox. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah. Um, and when you're in Congo, for instance, and you're setting up this response platform, is there a linkage with general health issues also, how the whole system must continue working when there's an, an emergency going on? Yeah, that's a huge, uh, a huge impact, actually. It's, you know, there was a huge impact that is on on the story that is untold is that the Ebola uh, outbreak shut down normal services, including the, the, the amount of childbirth, uh, mortality associated to childbirth uh, climbed up dramatically because there was no clinic open. Everything was at home. Uh, so, and this is just one example. You know, people with broken legs and arms that could not have access to medical, normal medical care because the clinic were closed. So this, uh, this is very important, yeah. And, and what we, we try to do here is uh, to address concern not only to, of, we are more interested in the highly con that what we call high consequence pathogen, but you know, they have their own concern about whatever it is. And we also at the same time um, 
help there. And it's, it's, a, it's a good thing because they are the same technique roughly, uh, whether you want to detect you know, pathogen A that is common and, and are low consequences, uh, and pathogen B that could be a high consequent pathogen. And so it, it's, being used, it's being used also as a, as a, a way to keep the, the skills up and, yeah, and, and get things going. Please. RDI. Um, my question is with the Zika uh, vaccine. If you do get to regulation, what's the next plan? If you could share a little bit where you would test it, which. There's a, so we have a, uh, with, with the, the partners, we have a level two already planned uh, in Puerto Rico. And um, I'm hoping also in Cuba, if Cuba is really, uh, you know, maybe if they would listen to me now, they would really, um, <laughs> Are we? <laughs> but so it's really it, like I'm, I, you know, I'm mentioning this, but it's very initial steps. But um, the, the phase two is already planned. As uh, again, like it needs, you know, it needs a lot of work. Like these are all uh, our our um, uh, very optimistic timeline, uh, and and we want this. This we hope that this phase two will start within uh, actually uh, three months of the completion of the phase one. So we're talking about. Uh, you know, early 2017, which is quite fast, because this, this, the phase two will tell us if the vaccine is associated with benefit or not. And, and keep in mind, there's a possibility that we achieve the opposite, and that's not what we want, but if there is, and it did happen in the past, if there's a side effect or if there's an association with actually, let's say, increase uh, of infection, I don't know, I'm just picking one, that's the one thing you want to know right away. Uh, you know, this, this disease is associated with, uh, well, clearly with microcephaly, which is dramatic enough. Uh, but there is also a mounting uh, association with Guillain-Barré, which is a neurologic disease. So, you know, there's always the possibility that some vaccine uh, may create condition that may increase that rate uh, or make it uh, stronger. And that's the, really the one thing you want to detect right away and make sure that then these vaccines are being shut down. And, and maybe study to understand what's happening. But I think overall, you know, it's, um, it, it, we always find a, a solution. So it's, it's to, to get there faster than, and to identify the, the plus and the minuses. And, and by the way, this is why we picked that vaccine platform. It's not replication competent at all. It doesn't replicate in the body. And, and we think that that, that, that will uh, completely annihilate the chance of gain body to, uh, to emerge. Uh, but, you know, there is nothing like you need a proof. G Gary, you're touching something interesting because vaccines are not always successful. You no. know, don't reach stage four, yeah. you know, and the time it takes. So take Zika. It comes with a mosquito. The mosquito is ubiquitous, you know, now. It bites in the daytime. Uh, it's very present in urban setting. Uh, we know it can reproduce itself in a bottle of Coke with a little bit of water in it as a good breeding ground. You know, sun is eating, you know, everything is, works perfectly. You have an incubator mm -hmm. in, in real life. So what else can be done? It might not be your area of expertise, but, you know, is working only a vaccine sufficient? No, no, and right now, I mean, the big effort are on vector control, right? And that's, it must be a priority. It has to be, I mean, it, it has shown a tremendous uh, beneficial effect against malaria, for example, where, you know, if you control the vector, you control the dengue as well. Uh, so very, very closer to, to Zika. So vaccine is definitely not, uh, it's just one of the many, and it's not, it's more of a long-term shot. Uh, but ultimately, uh, if you really want to protect the a community, a population, uh, you know, you can try sometimes to put all the screen you want in a window and to be covered, uh, you know, to, to above your head. But, yeah. you know, chances are at one point, if you're in a, and if you're in a country where mosquitoes are carrying the virus, it is, you know, I, I don't know me, I'm, I'm in Winnipeg, so there's a lot of mosquitoes. So I, mean, I get it's starting every now. year. <laughs> and they are big. Hey, I'm hearing that size. Uh, so <laughs> rabbit fly away. <laughs> Not because they fly. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Do we have any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, it's Ken Ugu, at Global Affairs Canada. Uh, given the um, VSV vaccine that we have right now, is it possible to scale down the um, level of the facilities that are, the research is being done right now? 
like instead of doing most of the work in level four, to do um, some of the work in level uh, three. Thank you for this comment. I, I, I myself, as the chief of a special pathogen program for 10 years, I would be 200% behind this. You know, actually, as of now, Ebola does not qualify, if you look at the definition, as a level four pathogen in Canada. Because to be a level four pathogen, it has to be, no vaccine have to be available. A counter argument to this is, and there's many, is, is it's unlicensed, but let's assume it's licensed, okay? And then we can vaccinate people, uh, and uh, absolutely, in theory, actually, it can be downgraded to level three. Is it gonna happen? Whew, I don't think I'm gonna see it in my lifetime, but maybe one day uh, we'll see. But it makes sense what you're saying, yeah. And some countries actually, like look at South Africa, CCHF, Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever, the most hemorrhagic fever virus known um, is a level three pathogen because it's endemic. And for them, it doesn't make sense to have this and they have a level four. Uh, so, so level of biocontainment are specific to, you know, country's decision, although there is international guideline, uh, but you're totally right. Normally, uh, if you develop a treatment and, and on top of it, a vaccine, and you have both, um, it, it doesn't qualify per se, if you look at the pure definition as a, as a level four pathogen. And for some of our audience, pathogen type one, two, three, and four is a system that defines the level of danger with a pathogen. Level one is a fairly minor pathogen. Level four is something that kills you rapidly. And when we talk of laboratory from you know, level one to level four, it's that the infrastructure that is required to work with the pathogens is totally different. In the level four, this is where you'll see, you know, people with, you know, uh, cosmonaut suit, you know, uh, positive hair pressure that blows air in the suit in order to push away the pathogen if ever they get into the suit, where you wear multiple layer, you have to go through a SAS, and then you go into the lab. When you come back, you need to be washed. You need to change your clothes and you need to walk home. So, you know, the level four lab, there's one in Canada, if I'm not mistaken, for human. Two uh, in the same building, yes. Yeah. Uh, one in, for human. In Winnipeg, where you are located. Yeah. So, you know, this is the high tech, you know, lab where you need to work extremely carefully because this pathogen jump out in the wild, you know he will find or she will find you and, you know, can eat you alive. So this is the reason why we are uh, talking of these level because they are quite important when it comes time for development of vaccine and testing. And uh, they are expensive also. But if we don't have them, you know, forget about doing research on these things and preventing, you know, the spread of some of these diseases that may come to our world. Yeah. So, so the important, just to want to mention, because why it's important to downgrade a, an agent, a pathogen, is because you open the door for the scientific community to work on it. Because if you keep something in level four, there is growing level four capacity worldwide, especially in the US, there are up to 10 in Europe, it's building like crazy. And I'm hoping we'll get one more in Canada. But for now, uh, this is it. And if you keep, when the onus comes back to a very small community that cannot do a lot of things because they're too small. So if you if you downgrade an agent and then everybody can work on it, the work gets done like crazy fast. And so that's that's what's important. Sure. Thank you so much for the talk. It was a very well articulated talk. My name is David from the Nate Tech, and it's more of a comment. I think the um, the priority when it comes to public health and um, collaboration, it has to shift from biomedical to um, social public health. When you look at um, the Global Fund, you know, it still funds uh, HIV, AIDS, TB, malaria. And you look at uh, UN AIDS, which is so UN organization dedicated to HIV. We are playing a catch-up game trying to change um, game from Ebola to Sega. And I think last week, the US Congress debated about shifting some of the fund for Ebola to fight Sega, just because of the... Um, the transmission of 80 species that's uh, coming up to southern states. All these diseases are going to emerge no matter what. What if we invest in, the, in the infrastructure, as you uh, suggested, but there should be a global fund for health, and I don't think there's any political will for that to happen, um, unless, uh, you know, maybe uh, IDRC may take it up, take up the leadership. I'm not a politician. <laughs> um, Gary. 
We, by the way, it's an excellent question. We discussed this today uh, with expert, uh, and you have a very, in my view, very uh, accurate view of one of the challenge we're facing. But Gary, it's it's for you to answer. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sorry, I was thinking about this. Can you repeat just the end of this of what you are, you are saying? It's very um, <clears throat> the approach we take is very biomedical, and yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's right. So it's very um, vertical instead of yeah. horizontal program. Yeah, you, you're totally right. You're totally right. And uh, that's a great comment. And you, you made me think about something that, uh, um, yes, and, and so we're always catching up, right? Trying to, anyway. Um, so, so, so that's what we were also talking about, that uh, investing into um, what we call platform that can actually be, be flexible to different applications. And not only that, processes. As I mentioned at one point, you know, to have ethical discussion uh, ahead of, of the, when the problem is there. Uh, but, but I think Jean mentioned something that is very uh, interesting I never thought of, that is totally true, is that in our, some, talking to somebody else, uh, in our system, um, democratic system, we change government every four years, so it's, uh, it's more complicated to make those long-term commitment of investment um, and to have a very long-term, because the government is, is focusing on their four years term um, and, you know, I don't mean this as a criticism. I mean this as, as maybe a reality. And that somebody else said, well, but I'll give you this example right now that is happening, that the government is, is actually projecting themselves, um, you know, like uh, 10, 15 years ahead, 20 years ahead. Uh, and so it's not broadly applicable. But for, maybe for these type of things, there is some, certainly some, some, uh, some work to do. I, you made me think about something. Um, is and I'll, I'll share you with uh, that because yeah we play catch up and uh, so to speak and and you know we we've been lucky as of now I think in Canada very lucky uh, because we didn't have a, a big problem as of now you know uh, influenza 2009 we had SARS uh, you know not so many cases uh, it cost a uh, billion dollars to the city of Toronto or, or more it was dramatic in terms of economic impact uh, but in terms of cost of life. And, and uh, crippling the healthcare system, and uh, like right now, there's 4,000 babies in Brazil alone that have microcephaly. 4,000, and each one of them will cost five millions of dollars on their lifetime. Okay, so 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 that is a huge cost in terms of resources. Not even mentioning the cost in terms of social uh, disruption. So, you know, we can say all we want that mosquitoes are not coming here. Um, at the best of their knowledge, they are, we know they are not here for now, and and you know very unlikely that they would they would migrate that north. Um, but whether it's Zika or something else, and again, I don't mean to scare anybody. I, what I mean too is is we have to concentrate on those solution and set simple processes so that we can react faster, so that we can address questions, maybe in a better way. That that uh, because we have all these example of, you know, what didn't work so well and what worked really well, and how can we make this even better. Uh, so, so what you're saying, totally yes. I agree. And we have to remember that at the beginning of the century, this city was the last city in Canada where malaria was present. You had malaria transmission because the mosquito was present year-round because the mosquito in the winter was living on horses and small mammal that people were keeping in their barn in their backyard before cars were invented. And the vector came to Ottawa through the Rideau Canal that was dig by people that were migrant in many instances and were carrying the uh, malaria uh, with them. So for a few years in the 1919, 1920s, malaria was present in this city. People don't know this. Water, sanitation, you know, uh, construction of uh, waste uh, system eliminate this but it's always a potential and I think what we have to be careful is not to build fear because you know I don't think that we believe in you know the fear factor you know to no, no, make things uh, move. Yeah. this does not work doesn't achieve anything term. but I think the, the advocacy that Gary might be doing and what IDRC that is only advocating for research to make the world better could do is that we need to do this work not only in times of crisis, but also when there's no crisis. Because when there's no crisis, this is where you have time to think, you have time to develop protocol, you have time to look at what's the situation, what's the response, you have the time to build the capacity, 
And when people are dying around like you have witnessed from close, you know, it's not time to do this. It's time to find a solution and to respond to you humanitarian crisis. So I think that's quite important to remember as we are uh, moving in this world where there's a lot of, you know, transportation, movement, migration, uh, situation of conflict, climate change, that are all contributing factor. Which level? We don't know. But we know that through a research process, we can find better solution. Yeah. And, and yeah, I don't really don't want to come out as a, as a fear factor because this really is, is a bad idea. And, uh, and it's not about that. I'm just, uh, you know, one would say we're lucky. We're, maybe we're not just lucky. Maybe we got the things right. Um, but, and, and, and infectious is only one of the pie piece that I showed you, right? There's a lot of other things yeah. out there. And uh, so there's a lot of it's a matter of priorities and, and how we, we tackle them in a way that we think is optimal. We have three last question or comment, sir, sir and madam. And if there's any others, we'll keep them for Gary will make himself available after the formal portion of this program, if you allow me. So please, sir. Merci beaucoup pour la présentation. Well, thanks very much for your presentation. Thanks for reminding us of the importance of partnerships and cooperation in public health. I'm Renaud Boulanger. I work with the Ethics and Research uh, Advisory Committee at the IDRC. I'd like to talk to you about the plan that you put forward today, strengthening capacity, building capacity of healthcare systems, but also the uh, capacity in research. And I think that this is uh, where I would put my focus. I'm curious to know what your opinion is on the uh, the possibility of the lack of capacity at the research level to perhaps derail, to derail research. You said that there's a lot of resources that are being invested in Europe, in Canada, and also in the U.S. Uh, to build capacity in the research area. But don't you think that uh, a local lack of capacity or lack of local capacity might uh, derail the process? Well, we'll take a whole series of questions and then we'll allow you to answer. Cameroon High Commissioner, I uh, congratulate you for uh, the presentation. I think uh, the last speaker has just posed the question I wanted to. I'm interested in knowing a little bit more about this capacity building, especially in the local uh, back on the field. I noticed that you, you have identified a number of points you call notes or something like that, yeah, no, areas. Sir. And I, I'm interested in knowing uh, the nature of work you're doing in terms of building capacity and promoting cooperation. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. And the last question. Hi, Gary. I'm, my name is Pornali, and I'm with Mike, NML. Okay. Uh, last year, yes. actually, I started in 2012, so I know about you and everything. So, what is and Mike, Mike Drebert in oh, no. uh, yeah the same lab. So, um, my question and my background is from India, and partly in Canada, I started my advanced uh, studies. So, this is regarding the same line of capacity building. So, like the class four pathogens, the high impact factor, and all those infectious uh, things, uh, keeping in mind. Doing this type of collaboration, what is your idea? I'm curious to know your view, subjective view, that in terms of capacity building, when uh, this type of infectious disease like originates from there, so in terms of identify that pathogen and diagnose the disease in Africa in terms of capacity building, is that possible by doing this type of collaboration? Uh, I mean, it's the same way, like top, top down rather than horizontal. So one thing is fund, the other thing is how much is possible given the other priorities in the developing countries. Yeah. So. Okay, I'll start with, with answering this, this one. Um, you know, yeah, the answer is yes, you can, you can focus on identifying new pathogen. We could do, do it here in Canada, and there was some, um, some, actually some project in Canada, like sampling bats and caves and and try to find new uh, new viruses, a new pathogen. So the answer is yes. What, what's important though is to keep uh, the focus on what's important to them again. And that's, you know, I can just speculate on what's important to them. I have a good idea because I spent a lot of years there, but but ultimately we need to go back and they need to tell us. But if it, 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 what's important is, is, is the, 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 the capacity to do that detection, you know, that's, then we need to focus on that. What you're identifying is secondary, in my view. 
Um, and when we do this, we don't do this only as a, as a silo project or a silo objective. It's all, everything that comes with this is biosafety, biosecurity, uh, training, make sure that also the, the training and the knowledge uh, stays there. Uh, we, we select people that, and they select their own people, but we, they select people based on uh, people that they know will stay, have a strong link to the country instead of, of moving away. So they, there are lots of different challenges. But the answer is yes. Yeah, it's, uh, I think it's a great opportunity actually to do that pathogen discovery. It's not the only project. Trust me, there's a lot. Uh, but, but there's nothing that like, uh, people in their own country to know where to do, go dig. Um, so, so that's one. The, the, the very important question about the, what, what kind of building capacity, again, is to, we need to address their, their interests, things that are of interest to them. I'll take the example of DRC. Their big interest, when we showed up in 2007, um, they had zero capacity to, de to detect Ebola. None. All the samples had to go out. And not only Ebola. Ebola was only one of the many viral hemorrhagic fever viruses that they deal with. Um, as a matter of fact, even monkeypox. Uh, there was a lot of even common bacterial infection that uh, you know that, that were detected, but not optimally, uh, maybe. Um, so we, what we did is we assembled, using equipment from left and right, we assembled a lab, actually. And then we invited them to come also to Winnipeg. We went there and we did a uh, training exercise. Uh, they taught us a lot of different things as well. And so when we left, and in 2014, when the outbreak hit, they had a full lab in a box. And they moved it on the side uh, within a week. The lab was there. It normally, it would have taken a month. And so why it took a week, the reality is that they went first a, a team that stayed three days doing sampling, went back home. That, that is an additional two days. And then got the diagnostic right away, positive. They send a lab two days, so seven days had passed. And they were on the ground operational. So that was phenomenal. Uh, to have this kind of, of rapid response. Like for us to come or CDC to go or the, the EU, it takes a lot of time. So, uh, so at the end, this project, what I'm really hoping for is that we would not only have research on going there, project, we will drop and we will have equipment for them. We will have a, a secure environment. We will have secure for themselves and for the world also. So uh, it, it can be, um, you know, including freezers, including... Uh, Locked, locked areas, it could be uh, secure places like this. So, so it, it's all a, a, a big package with, you know, the, the public health angle is very important. And uh, the ethics. First. Lytic. Yes, this is a very good comment. And, uh, and uh, the, the answer, unfortunately, is yes again. Uh, that, that yes, the, the um, ethic could, could derail that. But see, um, I don't see it that way. I see it as so it means we have to build that part too, and that's fine. Uh, in Guinea, there was no ethical community to review the vaccine trial, and now there is. And all the research projects that are going through Guinea and Sierra Leone and Liberia, they all have their ethic committee now. So, you know, it's, it's just to build it. And these countries have a lot of challenges. Uh, they have a lot of priorities that are more important, honestly, than, than this, maybe this one. But it's just a matter of also highlighting that if this is needed, it, it will happen. We can just help make this happen. And, and one of the, the way also to do this is do like what Health Canada did, is they sent two people and they met with the, the people of, of Guinea and they developed their own, you know, their own framework of regulation, but using something that already existed from Health Canada. And it didn't take... You know, this, this was very fast. This was just before the vaccine. And this is in place now in Guinea. So it's the same thing. I think that, you know, ethics from other places, including Canada, ethical uh, um, people in ethics could go and, and also uh, interact and, and uh, be part of it. Merci. Gary, you, we have a lovely audience. That's stay. Oui. Um, non, c'est terminé. C'est terminé. No, that's it. Uh, well, he'll be available. He'll be available afterwards, all right? Mm. Message that you want to give to this audience to take on? Only one. What would it be? Uh, I like to take people by surprise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, first, I have a, a, a one message in A and B. 
AM. <laughs> no, listen. The 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 main message uh, I think is is um, um, that I've learned, and I I want to share this is that I think this huge contribution was was done because we were collaborating, and that we were um, we have we were creating links, and we had created links with people that were a lot more than just. Uh, science, scientists collaborating. We were friends. We had um, a, a high respect from one another. And uh, ultimately, above that all, is that we all loved what we were doing. And so my message, whatever you do, and, and I'm sure you know it anyway, is uh, if you love what you're doing and it's contributing to help others, well, Lord, what a wonderful life. Uh, so, so that's what my message and my B part very quickly. If you're excited by this project at any level, just let me know. Write me an email, and you know because because we want to be inclusive. This is not a, this is the, the strategy of this, and we're trying to to make this like uh, not too large and too out of focus. But you know we may not I may not tell you like okay you you can do this right away, but maybe along the way uh, we can include the, your objectives uh, in the project. So don't hesitate. Thank you. Thank you. I've told you before we start this conversation with Gary that he was an humble man, that he was a great scientist. I think he has talk of this in spade. And, you know, at IDRC, we all know, or you may all know, that we are driven by knowledge, innovation, solutions. We want to make with the research we're sponsoring and the researcher that we're helping a change and have an impact at a scale that makes a difference. And I think you represented that. We are supporting collaboration with other agency, but also with network of researchers. You demonstrated this, Gary. And also, we like to support leader in science, the young that you will be supporting in, in the Université Laval, as well as, it's tough to say, but the more established like you, Gary, and that make a difference in the world. So you are perfect representation of why IDRC believes strongly that research for development make a change, make a change in Canada, but it makes also a tremendous and important change in the developing world as you show up with the uh, success of the ring vaccination trial. That was a journey of humanity for a change. So thank you very much for your time and thank you everyone for your uh, great attention and your participation to this conversation and we'll see you at another time. Merci beaucoup. Thank, thank you. you. Merci Gary. Thank you.